good to see you this morning. If you have your Bibles, and I hope that you do, turn with me to John chapter 8. John the 8th chapter. I want to talk about Jesus this morning, our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. We do have guests with us this morning, and we appreciate so much you coming to be with us here at Kenwood. If you have any questions about the things that we do here this morning, we would love to sit down with you. We ask for an open Bible and an open heart to study what does the Bible say. That's what we're interested in. And I assume that's what you're interested in as well. So let's take that time to do that if you have any questions. The elders are available anytime. I'm available anytime to meet with you and study the Word of God. You just let us know. Grab a bullet on the way out. Our contact information is on there. And we would love nothing more than to sit down and study the Word of God with you. And that goes for everybody here this morning. Um, not just our visitors. If there's ever a time that you want to study with one of us, we would love nothing more than to do that. I want to begin this morning by setting the scene as Jesus is going to make a claim as to himself. You know, the Jews in Jerusalem are in the midst of commemorating the, the Feast of Tabernacles. And back in chapter 7 of John, Jesus in verse 37 would say, If anyone thirst, let him come to me and drink. And Jesus would give this invitation as the priest would get water from the pool of Siloam and they would carry it in a golden picture, water, and, and they would go to the temple, then they would go around the altar. And as they would near the gate, the shofar would be blown. And they would sing psalms of, of praise to God for his provisions in the wilderness. This pouring out of water would symbolize and it would serve as, as a reminder of God's provisions for them in the wilderness. But it would also look forward to the prophesied Messiah that was coming, where streams of water would flow from the rock, that rock being the Messiah. So in the midst of this ceremony, as they're pouring out the water, Jesus says, if anyone thirsts, let him come to me and drink. Obviously, Jesus, making the claim to these people that he is the fulfillment of all of this symbolism, but it wasn't just symbolic pitchers of water during the Feast of Tabernacles. It would also have a ceremony where lamps would be lit. And in the temple court, there would have been four large candelabras. And they would light those candelabras in the midst of darkness. And it would light up all the courtyards. And you can just imagine how beautiful this must have been. This symbol of darkness would remind the people of how the Lord had led them in the wilderness on the way to the promised land at night with a pillar of fire. So there's this incredible scene. And it had to be beautiful. These flames burning, providing light and darkness, lighting up the temple complex. And Jesus makes an incredible claim as to himself, one having far-reaching consequences for even us. And he makes this claim to even his enemies. John chapter 8, at verse 12, in the midst of light and darkness, Jesus again spoke to them, saying, I am the light of the world. He who follows me will not walk in darkness, but will have the light of life. Jesus tells these people, his critics, his enemies even, that I am the light of the world. Let's talk about what that means. You know, we've heard this statement. Our children are going to be singing this statement by way of our VBS in coming weeks. And, and no doubt we, we make initial connections as we think about this idea of Jesus being the light of the world. But what did Jesus mean specifically at this time with this audience? Well, number one, I would suggest to you that I think there's no doubt to say that he is the light of the world is to say that Jesus is making his claim to deity, that he is God. And let's just take just a moment to develop this. But remember, these Pharisees would have considered this claim to be blasphemy. And you know that ultimately would use this as grounds to even put him to death. You know, if you go back in your Bibles to the prophets in Isaiah chapter 60, some 700 years before Jesus comes to this earth, I want you to listen to the prophet speak of Jesus, the Messiah to come. Isaiah chapter 60 at verse 19. Appreciate the language of light. No longer will you have the sun for light by day, nor for brightness will the moon give you light. Now listen to this. But you will have the Lord for an everlasting light. 
and your God for your glory. Your sun will no longer set, nor your moon wane, nor will you have the Lord, uh, for you will have the Lord, I should say, for an everlasting light, and the days of your mourning will be over. The prophet here, he prophesies that the Messiah, the Lord, he would come and he would be their light. He would be the light for the people. What they would need to truly see. And he says, you will have the Lord for an everlasting light. He says, the days of your mourning will be over. Darkness will be over. Jesus, he comes along and he says, I am the light. And essentially says, I am God. I am the Lord. But number two, I think it's abundantly clear if you go back to the prophets, Jesus, by making this claim, he's making the claim that he is the prophesied Messiah. He is the one to save them from their sins, the one that they had been longing for, a spiritual Messiah come to save them, to redeem them, to ultimately die for their sins. And throughout the prophets, the prophets described a world that was separated from God in darkness. And they pictured Israel, God's chosen people, as in darkness as a result of their sins. A state of mourning as we saw in the last prophecy. But in speaking of this darkness and this hopelessness as a result of their sin and their rebellion against God, they also spoke and prophesied of a cure. Because darkness desperately needs light. And that light's going to come in the form of a Messiah, a Redeemer, to give light to the world. If you go back to the prophet Malachi in your Old Testaments, in Malachi chapter 4, again, I just want you to listen to the prophetic language as to Jesus, the light of the world. Malachi 4, listen to verse 1. For behold, the day is coming, burning like a furnace. And all the arrogant and and every evildoer will be chaff. And the day that is coming will set them ablaze, says the Lord of hosts. So believe them neither root nor branch. But for you who fear my name, the Son of Righteousness will rise with healing in its wings. And you will go forth and skip about like calves from the stall. And you will tread down the wicked, for they will be ashes under the soles of your feet on that day, which I am preparing, says the Lord of hosts. Did you catch verse 2? For those who fear my name, he says, the name of the Lord, he says, the son of righteousness, the son of righteousness, S-U-N, that's light. The sun gives off light. It will rise and it will heal and it will bring about light in the darkness, life in death. Jesus says, I am the light of the world. I'm the Messiah come to save. But then number three, and I think really this is probably the crux of what Jesus is saying here and claiming to be the light of the world. Jesus would be the leader, the head, the authority of spiritual Israel, those who fear his name. You know, back at the beginning of John's gospel, we begin to see in this development of this imagery of light, light is shining in darkness. If you go back to John chapter 1 in John's gospel and you begin reading there at verse 1, in describing Jesus it says, In the beginning was the Word, that's Jesus, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. Verse 2 says, he was in the beginning with God, and all things came into being through him, and apart from him nothing came into being that has come into being. Jesus, deity, the creator of all things, there in the beginning. But listen to verse 4. It says, in him, that's Jesus, in him was life, and the life was the light of of men. Verse 5 says, the light shines in darkness and the darkness did not comprehend it. Life. It says life is in him, in Jesus, and as the life, he is the light of men. But listen to verse 5 again. This light, Jesus, it shines in the darkness. But here's the problem. We'll talk more about this in a moment. John tells us here that the darkness didn't comprehend it. You know, brethren, just from an elementary perspective, fundamentally, we understand that apart from light, there is darkness. Lost. No direction. Just wandering around. No purpose. 
You know anybody like that? We encounter people like this day after day after day. And when Jesus says, I am the light of the world, he is offering direction for those who would follow him, those who would accept him, those who would attach themselves to him, identify with him, live for him, obey him, and making them light essentially. As we said a moment ago, the prophets, speaking of God, they, they pictured a lost world, a world shut up in their sins. A world in darkness rejecting God, separate from God as a result of their sin and rebellion. And I go back to the prophets one more time. In Isaiah chapter 42, again starting at verse 5, just listen to the language. Isaiah 42 at verse 5, and just appreciate the cohesive nature of God's word, the harmony. Listen to verse 5. This is 700 years before Jesus would come. Thus says God the Lord, who created heaven and stretched them out. Who spread out the earth and its offspring. Who gives breath to the people on it. And the spirit to those who walk in it. I am the Lord. I have called you in righteousness. I will also hold you by the hand and watch over you. And I will appoint you as a covenant to the people. As a light, he says, to the nations. Listen to verse 7. To do what? To open blind eyes. To bring out prisoners from the dungeon. And those who dwell in darkness... From the prison. You see the picture, right? The Lord coming. The light of the world. The Messiah. He's coming to open blind eyes. To set those free from darkness. And if you turn over just a few pages in your Old Testament there in the prophets to Isaiah 49. I just want you to again to see this light imagery. Those attaching themselves to Jesus, the light of the world. And becoming light to the world. A world of darkness apart from light. Isaiah chapter 49, listen to verse 5. And now says the Lord, who formed me from the womb to be his servant, to bring Jacob back to him so that Israel might be gathered to him. For I am honored in the sight of the Lord, and my God is my strength. He says, is it too small a thing that you should be my servant? To raise up the tribes of Jacob, to preserve the ones of Israel. I will also, he says, make you a light of the nations so that my salvation may reach to the end of the earth. <laughs> light is the cure for darkness. Jesus is the light. Now, I bring all of this up to say this. These Pharisees, they should have known all of this. They were schooled in the prophets. They would have recognized Jesus as the light of the world. Remember back in chapter 6, I keep returning to this, but he just fed over 5,000 people with just a few loaves of bread and fish. And I want to return back to John 8, and I want to look at the rest of what Jesus says here. The Messiah. John 8 Back at verse 12. Then Jesus again spoke to them saying, I am the light of the world. Now listen to this. Understanding what Jesus means by that. Listen to the rest of the verse. He who follows me will not walk in darkness, but will have the light of life. Who will have the light? Who will be out of darkness? Our kids can get this. Those who follow Jesus. Amen. Those who follow Jesus will have the light. There's three things here that I want us to see. Number one, brethren, Jesus is the light of the world. Uh, is the light of the world. He is God come in flesh. He is deity. He is the Son of the living God. He is our Messiah. And he is our leader, our authority. Jesus is the light of the world, number one. Number two, if we follow him, truly follow him, submit to him, obey him, we won't walk in darkness. And then number three, we will have the light of life. Darkness. What is darkness? You know, darkness in Scripture, it's the picture of lacking purpose. It pictures a lack of direction. It's being lost. And brethren, you know, isn't that exactly what we see in this world day after day after day? How many of our friends, 
wandering around, trying desperately to find their purpose. And no matter how much they accumulate, no matter what they get, no matter what they wear, the car they drive or the house they live in, there is no contentment. There is no satisfaction. Divorce after divorce after divorce. So many people looking for the next best thing, trying to fill up that hole inside of them that only one can fill. That being our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. The Apostle Paul, a passage we looked at briefly on Wednesday night, if you still have your Bibles open, he makes that exact point in 2 Corinthians chapter 4. Turn over there with me. 2 Corinthians chapter 4, I want you to listen to verse 1. 2 Corinthians chapter 4, listen to verse 1. Going back to this light image, Paul says, Therefore, since we have this ministry, as we have received mercy, we don't lose heart. But we have renounced the things hidden because of shame, not walking in craftiness or adulterating the word of God, but by the manifestation of truth, commending ourselves to every man's conscience in the sight of God. And even if our gospel is veiled, it is veiled to those who are perishing, in whose case the God of this world has blinded the minds of the unbelieving, so that they might not see the light of the gospel, the glory of Christ, who is the image of God. Verse 5, for we do not preach ourselves, but Christ Jesus as Lord, and ourselves as your bondservants for Jesus' sake. For God who said, listen to this, light shall shine out of darkness. Amen is the one who is shown in our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Christ. I say it again, as Paul says here, there is only one cure for darkness. For those who are blinded with a veil over their eyes by the God of this world, there is but one cure, and the cure is the light, and Jesus is the light. But here's what's so awesome about this. He allows us to be light. When we abide in Him, and allow Him to abide in us. When we are connected to the vine, John chapter 15, when we allow Jesus and His words, His sacrifice, His love to transform us, we become the light. Darkness needs light. Those people that you work with, your family members who are not right with God. Those people that you encounter on a daily basis that are searching and searching and searching but remain lost. You are the light. And Christ is in you. You see, it's not us. That's why Paul says here, we don't preach ourselves. But the gospel is what we're carrying. And the gospel is the treasure that we have been entrusted with. You remember in Acts chapter 26, as Paul stands before Agrippa and he makes his defense. He recounts his conversion there in verse 12, his encounter with Jesus. And in verse 15 of Acts chapter 26, he said, And I said, Who are you, Lord? And the Lord said, I am Jesus whom you're persecuting. But get up and stand on your feet for this purpose. I have appeared to you to appoint you a minister and a witness, not only to the things which you have seen, but also to the things in which I will appear to you. Rest, listen to verse 17. Rescuing you from the Jewish people and from the Gentiles to whom I'm sending you. Why? Verse 18. To open their eyes. So that they may turn from darkness to light, from the dominion of Satan to God, that they may receive forgiveness of sins and an inheritance among those who have been sanctified by faith in me. In other words, Paul, I'm going to use you. I'm going to make you light. I'm going to give you the treasure of the gospel, the gospel of life, the gospel of Jesus Christ. And I'm going to allow you to take this light to darkness and open people's eyes. Paul, I'm going to use you in that way. And what greater mission could one have? You know, in verse 22 of that defense, Paul says, so having obtained help from God, I stand to this day testifying both to small and great, stating nothing but what the prophets and Moses said was going to take place, that the Christ was to suffer, and that by reason of his resurrection from the dead, he would be the first to proclaim light, to proclaim light both to the Jewish people and to the Gentiles. Verse 18, so that they may turn from darkness to light, from the dominion of Satan, darkness to God, light, that they may receive forgiveness of sins and inheritance with others who have been set apart by faith in Jesus. Wow, right? That's us. We are the light. Or are we? You know, it's for those of us who are truly connected to Jesus. 
What's it look like? Those who allow his words, his example, to truly penetrate our hearts. And it changes the way that we think, doesn't it? It changes the way that we act. It changes the way that we speak, the way that we react, the way that we love, the way that we treat people. Those of us disciples who are truly following Jesus, striving to be just like him, submitting wholly to his will as we have the light of life. Brethren, here's what it looks like. We get up every single day and we take this light and we go out into the darkness with the most noble goal of just punching some holes in the darkness. Allowing some light to come into that classroom. Bringing some light into that workplace. Allowing some light to come through in all of this darkness. We need to see these people as souls who have veils over their eyes. They're in darkness. They're lost. But we have the light because Jesus is the light. Jesus said in Matthew 5, describing true discipleship, he would say there at the beginning of his mountain sermon, at verse 13, so having obtained help from God, I stand, that's, that's wrong, Acts 26, I should say it, verse 22. So having obtained help from God, I stand to this day, Paul says, testifying both to small and great. Proclaiming light, he says at the end of verse 23, to the Jews and to the Gentiles. I meant to have Matthew 5 and verse 13, but you know what that says. That we are to be the light, right? That city that's set on a hill. We are to be the light. They see our good works. And they glorify God in heaven. And when we think about that passage that we quote often, that's a real difference, isn't it? That's making a lasting difference. Helping people see the light of the gospel. Escaping darkness. And all of its eternal consequences. How? Simply through an example of light. So powerful, right? So much to do. Jesus said in John 15, verse 5, I am the vine, you are the branches. He who abides in me and I in him, he bears much fruit. For apart from me, he says, you can do nothing. Bearing fruit, connected to Jesus, doing his will, allowing him to lead us. And brethren, when we do, bearing fruit, making that lasting spiritual difference in the lives of others, from darkness to light, proving to the world, those in darkness, that God's way truly is better. Brethren, that's what it's all about. Living proof, we are light. For the rest of our time this morning, I really want us to consider the response to this. And in so doing, consider our own response to this truth, that Jesus truly is the light of the world. And then if we follow him, we won't be in darkness. That we will have the light of life. If you go back to John chapter 8 in your Bibles, John chapter 8, I want you to listen to verse 13. So the Pharisees said to him, you are testifying about yourself. Your testimony is not true. And Jesus answered and said to them, even if I testify about myself, my testimony is true. For I know where I came from and where I'm going. But you don't know where I come from or where I am going. You judge according to the flesh. I'm not judging anyone. But even if I do judge, my judgment is true. For I'm not alone in it. But I and the Father who sent me. Even in your law, it has been written that the testimony of two men is true. I am he who testifies about myself, and the Father who sent me testifies about me. So they were saying to him, Where is your Father? Jesus answered, You know neither me nor my Father. If you knew me, you would know my Father also. And these words he spoke in the treasury as he taught in the temple, and no one seized him because his hour had not yet come. Jesus had given them everything they needed to believe in him. It wasn't a lack of evidence. They simply didn't want to follow him. They didn't want to accept him as deity. They didn't want to accept him as their Messiah. Jesus was sent by the Father to lead men and women out of darkness. They are one in purpose. And that should have been obvious by the words that he spoke, the signs he performed, the mission that he was on. But verse 19 exposes their heart their pathetic attempt to suppress the truth of who Jesus is and their need for Him. That perfect fulfillment of the prophecies that they are aware of. And they ask Him, Where is your Father? And Jesus says, You know neither me nor my Father. Because if you knew me, you would know my Father also. They were one and the same. 
can't have one without the other, which they were attempting to do. Now listen to verse 21. For those that refuse Jesus, if you hear nothing else this morning, I beg of you to hear this. For those that refuse Jesus, refuse the light, choose to remain in darkness, I, I just want you to know that there are tremendous and eternal consequences to this. Please hear this. Verse 21. Then he said again to them, I go away, and you will seek me, and will die in your sin. Now listen to this. Where I am going, you cannot come. So the Jews were saying, surely he will not kill himself, will he? Since he says, where I'm going, you can't come. And he was saying to them, you are from below. I'm from above. You're of this world. I'm not of this world. Therefore, I said to you that you will die in your sins. For unless you believe that I am he, you will die in your sins. Brethren and friends, I'm not sure. There, there are sadder words that one could hear. Jesus tells these people that he's going away. And really what he's saying is, I'm going to die on the cross for your sins. I'm going to rise from the grave and I'm going to ascend back to heaven. I'm going to heaven, Jesus says. But he tells them, you can't come. You can't come. Jesus tells them, you will die in your sin. Verse 24 again, I said to you that you will die in your sins, for unless that you believe that I am He, you will die in your sins. Brethren and friends, to die in your sins is to be lost for all eternity. I hope we get that. It's to be separated from God and all that is good for all eternity, forever. But it doesn't have to be that way. But Jesus makes clear, there will be separation. Not everyone is going where he is going. Back in John 5, Jesus heals the lame man and has the audacity to do it on the Sabbath. And instead of standing in all of this miracle, they question him about the Sabbath. In John chapter 5, at verse 18, he says, For this reason, therefore, the Jews were seeking to kill him all the more. Because he was not only breaking the Sabbath, but also was calling God his own Father, making himself equal to God. Now back in John chapter 5, I want you to listen to verse 19. Jesus answered and was saying to them, Truly, truly, I say to you, the Son can do nothing of himself unless it's something he sees the Father doing. For whatever the Father does, these things the Son also does in like manner. For the Father loves the Son and shows him all the things he himself is doing. And the Father will show him greater works than these that you will marvel. For just as the Father raises the dead and gives them life, even so the Son also gives life to him he wishes. For not even the Father judges anymore. But he's given all judgment to the Son, so that all will honor the Son, even as they honor the Father. Who does not honor the Son does not honor the Father who sent me. Now listen to verse 24. Listen to verse 24. Truly, truly, I say to you, he who hears my word, There's the first part. He who hears my word and believes him who sent me has eternal life and does not come into judgment but has passed out of death into life. Judgment. The words that I have said, those will be our judge. Think about those parables that Jesus taught. The wheat and the tares, the dragnet, the parables picturing those belonging to God with those who don't. Living their lives together, enjoying the blessings of God, consuming. But then that net, it scoops the bottom of the sea. And the fish are separated, the good and the bad. You think about the weed and the tares. He tells them to lead them together into the harvest. But then the reapers come, and they take those tares, and they bundle them up, and they burn them. But the master says, you put the weed in my barn. You think about the parable of the ten virgins waiting for the bridegroom to arrive. But he's delayed. And they weren't prepared. So they got to go out and buy more oil. And while they're gone, the bridegroom comes. And those foolish virgins not prepared. 
And in Matthew 25 at verse 10 it says, And while they were going away to make the purchase, the bridegroom came, and those who were ready went in with him to the wedding feast. And then this last phrase, this phrase in the end of verse 10, it always gets me. It says, And the door was shut. Later, the other virgins also came saying, Lord, Lord, open for us. But he answered, truly, I say to you, I don't know you. Be on the alert then, for you do not know the day nor the hour. You know, it breaks my heart that so many are in darkness. So many will be unprepared. So many have and continue to reject the light of the world remaining in darkness. Maybe you're here this morning. And you've been rejecting the lie. I beg of you, reconsider. Back in our text in John 8, as we, as we wind down. John chapter 8, at verse 25. John 8, at verse 25. So they were saying to him, who are you? And Jesus said to them, what have I been saying to you from the beginning? I have many things to speak and to judge concerning you, but he who sent me is true. And the things which I heard from him, these I speak to the world. They did not realize that he had been speaking to them about the Father. You know, verse 25 speaks loud to me. I, I, I think it would be appropriate to paraphrase here. Who do you think you are, Jesus? Who are you, Jesus? Who are you to tell me how to live? To tell me what to do? Who are you to tell me that I'm going to hell? You know, this is so many today. Our culture's attitude toward any type of authority. I'm going to tell you something. Jesus is God. He is our creator. And he has been given all authority by the Father. And he came and he died for our sins. And here's what so many miss. He is for us. He wants the best for us. His words, his commands, his examples, it's all for us. It's for our best. It's the best and will always work. Because Jesus is the light. He's the cure for our darkness. He is the answer. Now listen to verse 28. So Jesus says, When you lift up the Son of Man, then you will know that I am He. And I do nothing on my own initiative, but I speak these things as the Father taught me. And He who sent me is with me. He's not left me alone, for I always do the things that are pleasing to Him. And He spoke these things. And many came to believe in Him. You know, the Son and the Father, perfect fellowship, perfect harmony. The Son was sinless, therefore there was no barrier to the Father. Here's the problem. I'm not sinless, and you're not either. And our sin separates us from our God, but Jesus is the light. You know, the world truly is a dark place. I don't have to prove that to you. It's evil, it's frustrated, it's discontent, and it's lost. So here's what we do. Here's what we remember. Jesus is the light of the world. If we will follow him, we won't walk in darkness. And we will have the light of life. We must stay connected to Jesus. His words, his example is sacrifice. Brethren, let's go out into the world this week. And let us be lost.